Uh, well, hi, this is Dr. Etisham. I'm James Registered and I do teach for Plat 1 and Plat 2. And today I'm going to start a series of lectures on uh, Plat 1 to help the candidates to have a better understanding and memorization of their topics. Okay, so starting uh, with the cardiology and the cardiac tamponade. Okay, so what is cardiac tamponade, by the way? So this is when normally you have like 5 to 10 ml of the fluid in your pericardial space, okay? So if the fluid, okay, there's a pericardial effusion has developed so rapidly or has become so large that it's compressing the heart, that is called the cardiac tamponade. Okay, and it's a life-threatening condition, by the way. So if you have the pericardial effusion that has gone up to a level where it is compressing the heart now okay so heart wouldn't be able to relax okay so that's called the cardiac tempo now so there are different reasons that acute pericarditis aortic dissection trauma like if some trauma with a sharp object like a knife or, or with a glass okay that may as well the hemopericardium okay and that can develop so rapidly or large enough okay to compress the heart so that's a cardiac tamponade so very important thing in the cardiac tamponade is okay clinically that's a back triad and that is hypotension muffled heart sound and the raised JVP okay when your heart is actually surrounded with the fluid and that's putting a pressure your heart cannot relax so there will be low blood pressure okay heart sounds will be muffled because it is surrounded by the fluid and raised JVP okay that's are the findings okay then pulses paradoxes okay that is something that is related to the cardiac tamponade okay that is it is a diagnostic uh, it's not a diagnostic of cardiac tamponade and can occur in other conditions as well like lung disease asthma or severe um, CHF and some cases of uh, the hypovolemia as well but it is there in the cardiac tamponade as well so that is with the inspiration there is greater than 10 mm Hg drop of systolic blood pressure okay so what you're gonna find over here is that and the ECG you will be having electrical alternance okay that is if you can see this ECG so there is a small complex QRS and there's a normal one followed by small and a normal one that is called electrical alternance okay that is there in the ECG of a cardiac tamponade. This is because your heart is actually moving in that fluid that is it's swimming in the fluid and it's a to and fro motion. Okay, that's a wobbling motion. So that's why it is okay. And the ECG there's electrical alternance. One normal amplitude QRS and one small. The best test okay for the cardiac tamponade is the echocardiography. Okay, that is the best one. You need to choose that one if that's there in your exam. The other thing you can do is called the catheterization. Okay, but do not choose the called the catheterization. It is like when you are measuring the pressure of uh, the left and the right heart, and that is equal in this cardiac tamponade. The de definitive treatment or the choice is pericardial synthesis. Okay, they can give you an option of sub white surgical drainage as well, but you need to choose for pericardial synthesis where you put a okay uh, in below the z file you put a string towards the heart and you drain one and that's guided by the echocardiography so only if the pericardial synthesis fail you go for the sub z file surgical drainage so that's as far as cardiac tamponade is okay you need to look for that destroyed ecg electrical alternance echocardiography and you need to go for drainage on the x-ray you can see a globular heart okay that is surrounded with the fluid so it's like a globular heart So the next topic is acute pericarditis. Okay, acute pericarditis. It is the inflammation of the pericardium. Okay, that is surrounding the heart. Okay, so the pain of acute pericarditis. Okay, it is pleuritic and the positional. By positional, I mean that is typical of that. With the leaning forward, 
it relieves while with the coughing or the deep inspiration that it reverts okay this is a point you need to pick over there and on the ecg what you're going to find there is diffuse st elevation diffuse or saddle shape st elevation is there okay what is the difference between now here is the STEMI and the acute pericarditis ECG that in acute pericarditis there will be diffuse elevation and they are saddle shape or concave upward ST elevation will be concave upward like this concave upward okay and there's a trivial this is concave upward ST elevation this one while in STEMI there is convex upward ST elevation and that's only Okay, to some leads, okay, like in the interior leads or in inferior leads or in the lateral leads. Okay, uh, could be in the interior and lateral leads, but here it's a diffuse, it's, it's present, okay, all over the ECG. So, this is the difference between the acute pericarditis and the STEMI ECG, okay, and there will be like the other things which I have told you, like pleuritic pl pl chest pain, and that's positional as well. Uh, there are certain uh, like numerous uh, causes like viral infection post tremi as well okay dressler syndrome and the uremia uremic pericarditis there are neoplasms okay metabolic disorders as well connective tissue disorders they can also cause the acute pericarditis the thing is here important thing is um, yeah, let's discuss it after that like treatment for the acute pericarditis is NSAID okay you can combine the colchicine as well that's going to prevent the recurrence and if this doesn't work, you need to go for corticosteroid. Now, the important point over here is to differentiate between sometimes there's MCQ of acute pericarditis and Dressler syndrome. So acute pericarditis, okay, it occurs, okay, 24 to 72 hours or 96 hours post MI, okay. But the Dressler syndrome, it occurs two to six weeks post MI. So, the thing that's going to differentiate you and help you, okay, in picking up the option, that is this time duration. You need to remember this one. Dressler syndrome that also has the same etiology, okay, but like it happens two to six weeks. When it's happening two to six weeks post MI, you're going to tick Dressler syndrome. If it's like in two, three days, that will be the acute pericarditis. Okay, so acute pericarditis, chest pain that is positional and the pleuritic. Okay, the ECG, you're going to find saddle shape or con concave ST elevation and that are diffuse. The most specific sign on the ECG, okay, um, that is PR depression. That is not ST elevation. That's PR depression. You need to remember that one. If that is there, most specific, you need to pick that one. I've told you a number of reasons, difference between the acute pericarditis and the Dressler. That's very important. And what you're going to choose, that is NSAIDs. Let's move to the next one. So this is all about the acute pericarditis. Okay, here you can see the concave upward ST elevation like this. And in ST elevation and my they are like this. Can wax upward in acute pericarditis concave upward in ST elevation uh, MI that is convex upward. Now it's important is cardiac murmurs. Very important topic. Okay, and I'm going to make it very simple for you. Okay. Mostly you pick it okay from where the murmur is actually and whether it's systolic, diastolic, and something like that. Okay. So you need to remember this thing first of all. I'm going to make it very simple for you people. Arms, you know, you have two arms. So this is AR and MS. These both are both are diastolic murmurs. AR is early diastolic murmur, and the MS is mid-diastolic murmur. Yeah, early diastolic murmur and mid diastolic murmur you need to remember this one okay now <clears throat> what i'm gonna do is that i'm gonna deal you know that first heart sound this is just for remembrance okay first heart sound is produced by the closure of the mitral and the tricuspid valve and second one aortic and the pulmonary valve so we're gonna deal okay mitral and the tricuspid together and we're gonna deal the aortic and the pulmonary together. So starting from this AR, AR, and the other one is PR. 
that is pulmonary regurgitation and the counterpart like AS and AR. Let's deal with them. So AR we said that it was early diastolic murmur. So early diastolic murmur. PR has the same. AS you know. AS. Okay. Aortic valve is narrow. So it, that's ejection systolic murmur. AS, AR is the same. In AS there is ejection systolic murmur. Okay. And sorry. PR. Pulmonary regurg. Okay. So again. AR. Okay. We know that what we said already that in AR that's early diastolic murmur so AR and the PR they have early diastolic murmur and then comes to the counterpart like AS and PS I'm sorry AS and PS let me write it in a better way okay let's go again you need not to confuse this thing so first we tell AR from our equation, okay, what we made AR and the counter part of that is PR, and then we are going with the AS and the PS. So AR, PR, a little diastolic murmur, AS and the PS, they have ejection systolic murmur. I hope you're gonna remember that one. Now go to the other thing. So I'm going to take now the MR. MR and the other thing is TR okay the valves okay which close and the first half sound is pretty then comes the MS and TS okay so here in the MS you know okay it was mid diastolic murmur so MS and the TS they have mid systolic diastolic murmur sorry mid diastolic murmur and the MR and the TR, they have pan-systolic murmur. So you need to remember this thing. So first remember this arms, okay. AR has early diastolic murmur, MS has mid-diastolic murmur. Now, you're going to apply that one. AR, AR, and PR. AS and PS. So AR, as we said, that's early diastolic murmur. PR has the same. And A S, we know that aortic stenosis has ejection systolic murmur. So P S has the same. M R T R that's a pan systolic murmur. And M S, okay, we took it from here. That was having a mid diastolic murmur. And the other one is T S that's having a mid diastolic murmur as well. Okay, let's go next. There are the other things as well. Okay, the murmur of the aortic stenosis that radiates to your carotids. Okay, and the murmur of MR, that's a mitral regurgitation, that radiates towards the axilla. MR radiates towards the axilla, AS radiates towards the carotid. Now there are two more murmurs, okay, that is VST, okay, ventricular septal defect, that is again a pan-systolic murmur, but it is a harsh one, okay. So if pan-systolic murmur is so harsh, that's VST, and PDA, that is a patent ductus arteriosus, that is continuous machinery murmur. It's a machine like continuous machinery murmur. So that's a PDA. So this is as far as your murmurs are concerned, and this is very important. And you need to remember this thing, okay? Either it's early diastolic, mid diastolic, pan systolic, okay? That's going to give you a clue over there. And that's how you're going to pick the murmur. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult for you. So next one comes the aortic stenosis. So what kind of <coughs> murmur was there? That was ejection systolic. In AS, K okay, and in PS, there's ejection systolic murmur. So basically the aortic stenosis, the patient presents with the triad. Angina, dyspnea, and syncope. Syncope, angina, dyspnea, and syncope. These are actually the presentation of aortic stenosis. That's a severe aortic stenosis. So a 77-year-old woman with a mild exercise uh, intolerance and injection systolic murmur. You got an idea. Injection systolic murmur, either it could be like AS or according to the formula I told you, it, it could be the AS or the PS. Okay. So this is aortic stenosis. Okay. Why? Look at the age. 
aortic stenosis okay in patients okay who are approaching 80 okay or greater than 80 okay, aortic stenosis is most common and it is caused by calcification of the valve that's a normal aging process and in less than 80 years old if somebody is having aortic stenosis okay that is because of mostly bicuspid aortic valve bicuspid aortic valve so that's a age difference so 77 you you're close enough to 80 so if he has ejection systolic murmur that's gonna be the aortic stenosis and all the murmurs you pick on echocardiography so as i told you angina syncope and dyspnea okay these are the symptoms of the aortic stenosis and what you're going to do if a patient is asymptomatic the aortic stenosis you need not to do anything okay just medications if the patient is symptomatic go for the surgery if the patient is asymptomatic plus having lvf left ventricular failure decrease ejection fraction again go for the surgery so symptomatic go for surgery asymptomatic it's medical treatment and if asymptomatic Okay, but there is LVF. Okay, injection fraction is low. You need to go for the surgery again. There's much about the gradient as well, but that's not related to you. Okay. Now comes the pulmonary regurgitation. A 40 years old a man with a cardiac surgery when he was a child has a diastolic murmur. So you know that the AR the PR. Aortic regurgitation and pulmonary regurgitation both have early diastolic murmur so it's a diastolic murmur in the left upper sternal border it's likely diagnosis pulmonary regurgitation okay because AR okay that's not the site of the murmur that's of the PR and the left upper sternal border the AR you listen down there okay on the left side that's all also you listen on the left side but that's down there okay in the area of the tricuspid you listen it over there okay let's go to the mitral regurgitation okay you remember that the ARMS okay and you remember the mitral regurgitation MR and the TR they have a pan systolic murmur so it's a pan systolic murmur according to that formula okay so in the MR what happens is the MR okay with every systole okay because of the MR, okay, there's a back pressure, and that goes to the left atria and tend to the lungs, okay. So they develop the pulmonary edema, these patients. So this basilar crepes widespread and orthopnea that is okay showing the pulmonary edema here, and that's mitral stenosis in this case. Now mitral regurgitation, okay. Uh, then mitral stenosis okay mitral stenosis the most common cause is if that's us that's rheumatic disease the rheumatic heart disease mostly it involves the mitral stenosis and the second number a uh, mitral valve and the second one that is most commonly involved is AR a uh, aortic valve the first one is mitral and the second one is aortic that is most commonly involved okay and you know that ARMS apply that one it's gonna give you some of the answers MS a little mid diastolic murmur Okay, so yeah, here it says the mid diastolic murmur. Okay, and there will be the straightening of left heart border in the mitral stenosis. Okay, patient has mellow flash as well. Okay, um, yeah, and straightening of left heart border, mid diastolic murmur. Uh, that's showing the MS at the apex. Okay, so your murmur which area it is it's going to give you an idea okay so for mr ms you listen to the apex for tricuspid okay you go a little high on the left side okay for the pulmonary you are on the left side second intercostal space and for the aortic you go on the second intercostal space right side okay so the formula it's going to give you an idea the what it is and then you can look at where it is best hard that's going to give you an idea that what you should choose over there it's very important you will be having okay two three mcqs related to uh like these uh, valvular pathologies now comes the mitral stenosis okay so what happens that 
you need to understand this one okay okay the, there's a matter of stenosis so left atria is pushing to the into the left ventricle because the valve is stenosis it has to push harder and harder first it becomes hypertrophied and then it dilates and when it dilates it develops the atrial fibrillation over here so when the atrial fibrillation is there the blood stagnates in your left at atria and wherever the blood stagnates it has a tendency to form a clot and that leads to cerebral infarct because that's the left side of the heart very easy now comes to the cardiomyopathy so first one is dilated cardiomyopathy hypertrophic and the restrictive dilated cardiomyopathy the most common cause is if you are asked that's ischemia so your heart chambers dilate okay left more than right other causes are alcohol viral myocarditis chemotherapy doxorubicin peripartum cardiomyopathy so your heart is dilated okay and it cannot pump so diastolic function is fine but the systolic function okay it cannot pump properly so there's a systolic dysfunction so all the signs and symptoms will be the of, of the heart failure what you do you decrease the preload and the afterload the ac inhibitor beta blockers diuretics and digoxin okay that's the treatment now it's a hypertrophic now there are two things okay hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that is just because of the hypertension so your heart has to pump more and forcefully so it becomes hypertrophied that's because of the hypertension you need to control the hypertension only okay now as far as hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy which is given over there okay it's autosomal dominant condition and mutation is on chromosome number 14 and there's a diastolic dysfunction so heart has become hypertrophied okay over here as well the patient could may not be having any hypertension and still is having this thing because it's a genetic disease and a cardiosomal dominant mutation in chromosome number 14. fine enough so <clears throat> these patients okay hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy okay these patients they have a family history of sudden cardiac death and they come to you like he was playing he was exercising or something and he collapsed over there okay why does it happen okay because there in in these patients okay there is systolic interior motion of interior mitral leaflet so this interior mitral leaflet okay it comes and obstructs the aorta during the systole so during the exercise it has to pump forcefully okay and it obstructs the aorta patient collapses over there they have if they're going to give you a scenario like this I'm going to give you a typical history that he was like exercising or something and he collapsed over there and he's having a history of sudden cardiac death in the family so that is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy so you need to give the beta blockers because they're gonna and the calcium channel blockers you cannot combine the calcium and the beta blockers for the calcium channels non-dihydropyridine i mean because that's gonna slow your heart rate and may induce like pradycardia and ICDs because these patients they do develop the arrhythmias okay now restrictive cardiomyopathy restrictive cardiomyopathy has the worst prognosis of, of all of them and there's no certain treatment for that that is also a diastolic dysfunction and mostly it is related to uh, the connective tissue disorders okay and what's happened uh, what, what's happening in restrictive cardiomyopathy you can see it like a rigid non-compliant ventricle walls rigid non-compliant ventricle that is restrictive cardiomyopathy so they have systolic performance is often reduced but the problem over here is diastole as well okay overriding problem is impaired diastole dysfunction but there's a systolic dysfunction in restrictive cardiomyopathy as well so you just give the diuretics there's no definite therapy no good therapy for that and ultimate death is uh, from this arrhythmias or if you're with chf and yeah what's the definite if they ask in the restrictive cardiomyopathy yeah or transplantation
So let's go to the AV conduction. So you have the blocks, AV blocks, first degree hot block, second degree type one, type two, and third degree hot block. In the first degree hot block, okay, there is a constant prolongation of the PR interval. Constant prolongation of the PR interval. Normally the PR interval is two to five small, three to five small squares. Three to five small squares. Okay, if it's greater than five, ideally, like some books write, like six is a borderline, and you start from the seven. But you need to remember, if it's greater than five, even six or seven, that's prolonged PR. So it has a constant prolonged PR prolongation, constant PR prolongation. What I mean by constant is that here you look, it would be seven, 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 constant prolongation of PR interval. Okay. And no treatment is required, nothing to do. Now, movie strap two, movie strap one, you need to remember that there is a constant prolongation of PR interval followed by drop in QRS and followed by again shortening of PR interval. See over here, PR seems normal, then it's prolonged. Now it's prolonged more even, and there's a drop in QRS, and it's going to repeat the cycle again. This is movie stripe one. You need not to do anything. Okay. Then comes the mobile mobile strap two. Everything is fine in the mobile strap two. There's all of a sudden drop in QRS comes like there's no PR prolongation, nothing but suddenly the QRS is missing over there. You need to do a pacing over here. Then comes the complete hot block. The complete hot block is that when the atrials are beating at their own and the ventricles are beating at the you know the ventricles they have a tendency, okay? They can act as a pacemaker the cells as well beating at a rate of like 40 per minute okay so the AV node is completely blocked over here so the atria are beating at their own pace and the ventricles there's no relation between the P and the QRS okay and the definitive treatment is pacemaker you need to put a permanent pacemaker into these patients okay initially if this patient are symptomatic like type 2 and a third degree heart block you need to give the atropine 0.5 mg iv and you can repeat after three to five minutes to a total dose of 3 mg and if it's still not working patient is symptomatic um, you can go for the transcutaneous pacing and meanwhile you prepare for the transvenous pacing okay so do not confuse yourself with transcutaneous pacing transcutaneous pacing is when you apply the pads one in front of the chest another at the back of the chest and these are just actually giving you a time to prepare for the transvenous pacing because you cannot put a patient long enough on the transcutaneous pacing because that's uncomfortable. He has to lie down, okay, and the things like that. So you give the atropine, if it's not working, okay, you go for the transcutaneous pacing and meanwhile you prepare the patient for transvenous pacing. The trans you put through the internal jugular vein, okay, and you go into the right heart. Okay, but that is ultrasound guided and that does require a technique as well meanwhile you are preparing okay for that one you can go for transcutaneous so transcutaneous is never an option this is just a bridging okay we have been doing the atropine and the transvenous pacing and the definite treatment is permanent pacemaker okay if it's not reversed permanent pacemaker okay you need to go for permanent pacemaker below the clavicle okay under this skin okay you keep that device and you go through the subclavian to the right heart and you put the electrodes there and nothing is outside that is permanent pacemaker okay then it's temporary pacemaker that is transvenous as well that is you go through the internal jugular vein like you are passing the cvp okay there's a special type of catheter we call it a sheet sheet okay you pass that one and you pass the tpm wire through that one okay and you can keep the patient okay over for a couple of days that is that's not permanent that is transvenous pacing that's called temporary pacing ppm is what I, I have told you okay so definitive is that's permanent pacemaker but for that moment atropine if not apply transvenous and go for trans uh, apply transcutaneous and go for transvenous pacemaker again bradycardia logarithm that's important okay bradycardia is if you have less than 60 percent of 60 beats per minute and you have a sinus in the sinus predicardia in the sinus predicardia you need not to do anything okay until unless it's 
symptomatic. Even the heart rate is 40. If the patient is not symptomatic, you need not do anything. You need to observe the patient. <coughs> but if the patient is symptomatic, by symptomatic I mean if he's having the chest pain, he's cold, he's sweaty, he's having low BP, he's feeling dizzy because cerebral perfusion is now compromised. Okay, that is symptomatic. Sense particularly. You need to give 0.5 mg of the atropine and you can repeat that one 3 to 5 minutes, a total dose of 0 0.3. Okay, if it doesn't work, apply the transcutaneous pads and prepare for the transvenous pacing, that is TPM, temporary pacemaking, pacemaker. Okay, so transcutaneous, you need not to confuse yourself with the transcutaneous pacing. That is just a bridge. Okay, that is just a bridge. The batteries go for transvenous pacemaking. And then you go for permanent pacemaker. Because permanent pacemaker, you do it in a cath lab. Okay. Now, if you see at this log, it's like written that okay, if you have given the atropine, okay, but there is no good response. Uh, there is a good response to the atropine, but still, if you have given the atropine, okay, but it's a good response, but patient is at the risk of asystole. It, risk of essentially is like mobile strap 2 complete heart block with wide QRS complex if the patient has a previous episode of essentially or uh, the ventricle pause is greater than 3 you still need to go for pacing even if he has responded to the atropine but if there is a risk of essentially then go for transvenous pacing I hope that's clear to you so Quickly go to the anti arrhythmic medications, class 1, 2, 3. One is quinidine and lidocaine using the VTs. Um, yeah. Okay, and the class 2 is metoprolol. That's a beta blocker. Short acting beta blocker, by the way. The half life is like 5 to 6 hours. 6, six to 7, yeah. And uh, that's given in the AFIB as well. We do not give the beta blocker to patients who are having asthma and do not give the beta blockers to the patient who are having the AV blocks which we have already read okay particularly in mobile strap 2 and complete heart block contraindicating class 3 anti and it makes amiodron amiodron we give in the vt afib okay so amiodron is important it causes the fibrosis pulmonary fibrosis hepatic fibrosis and causes the hypothyroidism and the hypothyroidism as well it can cause both and the half-life of amidron is up to like 100 days and corneal deposits other than acetylol and ibutylide now the class 4 is calcium channel blockers that is non-dihydropyridine okay so you can give them in a AFIP as a rate control therapy there are two types of uh, calcium channel blockers Dihydropyridine, that is a low DP in and all, they do not have any effect on the heart. They just lower your BP. But these non dihydropyridines for up until they decrease your heart rate. Okay. So I'm talking about the non dihydropyridine. Now, there's another drug that's called adenosine. I'm going to discuss this one um, in more detail in SVT. Okay. This is the only drug that is exclusively used for SVT adenosine, adenosine. Okay, the contraindication of this adenosine is asthma. You need to ask. And the half life of adenosine is just 15 to 17 seconds. Okay, I'm going to discuss in detail later on okay, in the SVT topic. Now, there are anti angina medications. You have the nitrates, like you have heart of NGC, okay, which keeps sublingual. So nitroglycine is SSR by dinitrate. Okay, they reduce the preload. Okay, and uh, the, the side effect of nitrate is headache intolerance you need to remember that one you do not give the nitrates if the systolic bp is less than 90 okay because they cause the hypertension and you do not give them with the selectino fill because they're going to lower the bp okay chances of hypertension are very high over here then comes calcium channel blockers propamilin delta as a non-dihydropyridine so decrease the contractility Vasodilation decrease after load, so they cause bradycardia. Then comes the beta blocker: retinolol, metoprolol, and bisoprolol. Metoprolol has a half life of like six hours. Bisoprolol has up to eleven hours. That's the longest acting uh, in this group. Again, 
one that is that has the longest is uh, nebulol as well and nebulol is highly cardio selective okay nebulol is highly cardio selective it's not given over there so adenolol is also cardio selective bisoprolol metoprolol these are all cardio selectives okay how they reduce the angina by the way like uh, why we give the beta blockers so your heart receives its blood supply during the diastole the coronaries okay through coronaries during the diastole so if you're going to decrease the heart rate the diastole will be more fine or during a fast heart rate definitely during the slow heart rate because the heart will be having enough time to fill it properly that's why we give the beta blocker it did reduce the heart rate okay they reduce the heart rate so means this means that drastically is occurring properly and heart is receiving the blood supply through the coronaries then is ibuprofen okay that's a new drug by the way now very new but ibuprofen also uh, is a rate controlling agent and it acts through funny sodium channels okay where you cannot give the beta blocker as a rate controlling therapy you need to give the ibuprofen okay but one thing make sure when you are giving the ibuprofen okay they should be the sinus rhythm you cannot give the ibuprofen if the rhythm is not sinus need to take care of this thing again comes the amiodarone i have already told you cause it's fibrosis liver pulmonary you need to take care of the thyroid function test because it causes the hypo and the hypothyroidism hypo or hypothyroidism now comes the important thing congenital heart disease so they are divided into the two cyanotic and acyanotic so what comes under cyanotic tga okay i'm going to discuss the important one tof tetralogy of fallot tricuspid atresia okay and yeah these things the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease is tetralogy of fallot very important mcq okay but the child is going to present two months and onward with the tof but in the tga that is second most commonest the patient is going to present within days like maybe at the second day or third day of the life okay transposition of grip um transposition of great arteries because pulmonary arteries they are rising from left ventricle and aorta is from right ventricle so totally opposite so this patient cannot wait for like two months so you need to take care of this thing if someone is coming to you to the two to three pick tga if it's asked that is the most commonest cyanotic disease picked off as presenting at the two months stop off tga cannot wait for like two to three months it's gonna present within two three days tetralogy of fellow you already know pulmonary stenosis right ventricular hypertrophy overriding ast aorta and vst and you have a boot shaped heart okay tetralogy of fellow these all the things that require surgery Yeah. and then there are other cyanotic that per persistent tr truncus arteriosus and ipsion anomaly ipsion anomaly is the, actually you need to remember this term atrialization of right ventricle okay atria right atria that is very big and the right ventricle is small so it seems that okay atria has gone into the ventricle okay right atria has gone into right ventricle that is the atrialization of right ventricle here you can see right atria as compared to that one right ventricle yeah, no this is right atria oh and this is right ventricle as compared to that one very small so atrialization of right ventricle and that is the lithium used during the pregnancy now another is total anomalous pulmonary venous return when pulmonary veins did run into the right heart now comes the acyanotic heart diseases so important vst ast pda so I have already told you the VST pansystolic murmur, harsh pansystolic murmur. AST very important. If you find something like fixed splitting of S2, that is AST. Fixed splitting of and the MCQ comes like that. This fixed splitting of S2. That's AST. PD has continuous machinery murmur. I have already told you. Then comes the AO contraction. Correction of aorta that is with Turner syndrome 15 percent 
of the turner they are having this co-rectation of aorta and the second thing they are having is a bicuspid aortic valve well bicuspid means that normally a, a, a aortic valve has three cusps but here they are having the two cusps okay so there's a co-rectation of aorta then comes the Eisenmenger syndrome Eisenmenger syndrome is shunt reversal okay normally say for example it is AST, a VST. So left side is high pressure, right side is low pressure. So definitely it's gonna go like this. Okay, because of the pressure difference. Now what happens that okay when it happens okay for a long time, okay, the pressure is gonna build up over here. Then the back pressure in the right atrium and there are the lungs as well. So pressure in the lungs develops as well that causes the pulmonary hypertension so what happens is that eventually the shunt is gonna reverse okay so that is called Eisenmenger syndrome once the Eisenmenger syndrome develops okay there's no treatment you need to go for heart lung transplantation because the pulmonary hypertension has developed into the lungs as well and your heart is already in the street it's heart lung transplantation these patients do present with the cyanosis and the clubbing cyanosis and the clubbing and that is a shunt, shunt reversal Initially, it was left to right, now it is right to left. Now comes the hypertension. That is important. <clears throat> so, the hypertension is when your BP is greater than 140 or 90, or ambulatory BP is 135 or 95. By ambulatory means that our home BP monitoring, that is 135 or 85, greater than. So, you need to remember both of them. So this ambulatory or home BP monitoring that was devised because the people they used to come to the doctor and they were having something like white coat hypertension and they sit to the doctor the BP is high but when they are at the home the BP is fine. So they have devised the devices which they can measure their blood pressure okay attached with them at their home. Okay so if the clinical BP is greater than 140 or 90 or ambulatory BP or home BP is greater than 135 or 85 that is stage one hypertension if the patient is less than 55 you need to start with the ARBs by the way what drugs we are having we are having AC inhibitors and ARB we are having the calcium channel blockers we are having diuretics these are the three drugs okay so in less than 55 you start with AC inhibitors or ARBs. In greater than 55 or black African or Africocrabin, you need to remember this thing. The MCQ comes like this, okay? Black African or Africocrabin is given or sometimes it's greater than uh, 55 only, okay? So here you start with the calcium channel blocker. If it's not controlled, okay, what's the next step? Add C to A and here add A to C. And the third step is to add diuretics. This is how it works simple is that the first step you need to remember less than 55 greater than 55 less than 55 is inhibitor or ARB greater than 55 or, or even a young patient is black african or fricocrabin okay you need to start with calcium channel block if they, that's that's not controlling just add c to a or a to c and the third step that's common add the diuretics okay but this is not the rule if someone is coming to me who is having a diabetes okay who is having diabetes definitely okay even if he is 60 years old okay but the rule is like if someone is greater than 55 start with the calcium channel blocker but if someone is diabetic AC inhibitors are more helpful because they're gonna prevent the diabetic nephropathy so they or this rule doesn't apply go for the AC inhibitors okay or the ARBs because that's gonna prevent the diabetic nephropathy so exceptions are there okay you need to choose according to so hypertension and diabetes First step is AC or ARB, okay? And second is you need to add calcium channel or the di uh, th thiazolide diuretics. Okay, so this is important. Normal target is less than 140 or 1 over 90. Under the 80, this is important. Over the 80, it is like less than 150 over 90, okay? In type 2 diabetes um, mellitus, it is uh, same as normal clinical BP targets, okay? That is 130. 
in diabetes by the way it's 130 and 80 in diabetes plus ckd it's again 130 and 130 over 80 okay you need to have a strict glycemic as well as like hypertensive control in those patients with the diabetes and ckd so normal the target is one less than 140 or 90 in less than 80 we're not having the diabetes or ckd those who are having the diab uh, diabetes and ckd it is you need to uh, for the lower the bp okay it's less than uh, 130 over 80 and those who are greater than 80 <coughs> this is 150 or 90 you need to remember this one they keep on changing okay you need to consult okay what are the if, if it's something um very later latest is over there now it's so important ac inhibitors what they cause cough and then geodema okay cough and then geodema ac inhibitors are causing because of increased level of bradykinins okay maybe they can ask you this thing as well so they cause cough dry cough so if they started on the ac inhibitor patients develop cough what you need to do switch to arb okay switch to arb and the other thing is they're called the angioedema that's the swelling of the leaves and the mucosa you need to stop the ac inhibitors and this causes the hyperkalemia as well calcium channel blockers they cause the peripheral edema okay in the clinics the patient come that i am having the edema of the low limb okay because i have been started with the, this medication so they do cause this thing uh then the thiazide diuretics they cause hypokalemia okay hyperuricemia okay then there's another mcq okay that's coming uh, into my mind if you have started a patient on uh, ac inhibitors uh, arbs okay false turn and he's presenting with the hyperuricemia all the arbs they actually increase the uric acid level except low salt low salt then that decreases the uric acid level so if there's an mcq like that somebody is coming to you against okay, taking the ac inhibitor and he's having high uric is a level and sticking the wall sartan what you're gonna do okay do not put on other thing put on the low sartan because this is the only in this group that lowers your uric acid level low sartan low it lowers the uric acid level then comes the postural hypertension so postural hypertension is okay when your bp systolic bp that falls okay 20 or greater than 20. okay and you are sitting your taking your bp okay and you make a person stand for three minutes again you take the bp in standing position and if that bp okay it falls by 20 mmh of systolic or greater that is called postural hypertension that could be because of a number of reasons okay but this scenario says it's because of he's taking a lot of antihypertensive okay in olipril that is ac inhibitor okay and that is causing hypertension lodipine endopamide okay they are causing hypertension because he's using the three medications over here all are causing low bb so hypertension so that's why so multiple anti-hypertensive you need to see that one now the syncopial episode an elderly man uh, taking antihypertensive attends the gp after having the two attacks of syncope involving the loss of consciousness for a few seconds uh, he was standing in the garden when he had this thing his blood pressure was 1080 mmg on lying and dropped 25 percent when he understanding and heart rate was 80 what is the single most investigation okay single most investigation so heart rate um so the blood pressure dropped more than 20 mmg what you told so it's a postural hypertension so what you're going to do if the patient is having a syncope by the way what is a syncope syncope is brief transient loss of consciousness that is followed by spontaneous regain of the consciousness this is just for a few seconds okay as far as cardiac syncope is concerned that could be because of some arrhythmias okay the arrhythmia they are causing the hypotension okay and you drop on the ground as soon as you fall on the ground okay cerebral perfume okay uh, that, that arrhythmia, arrhythmia goes away okay your cerebral perfume is again restored and you got regain the con consciousness cardiac syncope is always like for a few seconds okay and you regain the consciousness so you need to go for the ecg say for example it says nothing is in the ecg what you're going to do halter monitoring that is 24 hour ecg that is halter monitoring 
because maybe the patient is having an arrhythmia at certain time of the day. So ECG, when you are doing, there's no arrhythmia. How are you going to find that one out? 24-hour ECG. It's going to pick up that arrhythmia. Now comes the severe hypertension. Severe hypertension is when your systolic BP is greater than 180 or your diastolic BP is greater than 120 okay, or higher. That is severe hypertension. Okay, here I will also like to tell you that what is hypertensive urgency or emergency. Hypertensive urgency is that when you are having this much blood pressure, but there is no sign of end organ damage, either clinical or lab. What do I mean by that? If the patient presents with the, this PP, okay, with the chest pain, with the SOB, okay, that is called, okay, hypertensive emergency. Or if there is like the LFTs or RFTs are deranged, okay, or if you can see the fundi, okay, and there are retinal hemorrhages. So either clinical or the labs with this much high BP, okay, there are clinical signs or the lab indicating the end organ damage, okay, or the fundoscopy. That is called the hypertensive emergency, okay, and you always control the hypertensive emergency with IV medications, IV sodium nitroprusside. If that's there, choose that one. You can choose um, IV labetalol, hydralazine, and there's another medication which is used in the USA. Maybe that's available in UK as well. That's enolipril, IV enolipril. That's AC inhibitor. That's a new one. If the patient presents with such a BP, okay, so it's greater than 180, greater than 120, but there are no clinical signs, no chest pain, no SOB, okay, um, uh, no dizziness, no headache, okay, and you see there are no retinal hemorrhages, okay, and there's there's no deranged LFTs, okay, uh, RFTs acutely. That is called hypertensive urgency, okay, if the target end organ damage is not there. So you treat hypertensive urgency with the medication, but emergency, you need to deal with the IV antibiotics. That could be uh, IV medications, that sodium nitroprusside, um, labetalol, hydrolyzine, and Enolipril, any one of them, but choose sodium nitroprusside. Okay, it's given over there. So malignant hypertension. Then malignant hypertension is that when you have have hypertension and you have the eye changes. Okay, retinal hemorrhages are pathology. That's malignant hypertension. So severe hypertension. I have already told you about this thing. Uh, okay. So. So in uh, in hypertensive emergency, you draw up the BP, but to, to only 25% in first hour. Say for example, the patient came to you with the 200 of the BP. In the first hour, you do not abruptly drop the BP. Okay, you can drop up to 25%. That's like 25% of 200. That's 50. Okay, so that will be 150. Because if you're gonna suddenly drop the BP, okay, and try to normalize it like into 120 from 220 or 200, that's gonna compromise your myocardial perfusion as well as cerebral perfusion and a patient is prone to do a stroke or a myocardial infarction. So this is all of what I have already told you, do a fundoscopy and if albumin to creatinine ratio, renal function tests, and that's all. Now comes the in infective endocarditis. Now the infective endocarditis, <clears throat> that's a important topic by the way. And the thing important over here is that what kind of organisms are involved and what you need to do and uh, what kind of uh, antibiotics you are going to start. Okay. So infective endocarditis, what are the risk factors? So, so valvular heart disease, valve replacement or previous episode, uh, IV drug abusers, prosthetic valves, okay, that is all. So whenever somebody is coming to you with a fever and a new murmur, Okay, always think of infective endocarditis. Patients coming to me with fever and a new murmur, think of infective endocarditis. Take a blood capture, start with the antibiotics, do an echo. Okay, that is you need to do. Fever plus murmur, infective endocarditis. 
okay so you need to send the blood cultures from two different sites okay three sets of blood culture ideally from two different sites okay every set one hour apart okay so you're gonna take the blood culture from two different sites then one hour apart again the same thing from two different sites then again from the one and you need to start the patient on antibiotics so prophylactic antibiotics what's given in the uk at the moment is amoxicillin and low dose gentamicin amoxicillin and low dose gentamicin if the patient is allergic to it says that amoxicillin then choose vancomycin and gentamicin okay that is for the native wall if it's a prosthetic wall okay <coughs> then choose vancomycin lefempicin and gentamicin okay so a new murmur plus a fever think of pe take blood culture okay give antibiotics okay and then do the echo to find out so it has a due criteria okay major criteria minor criteria you can go through that one if you have two major criteria or one major with the three minor or four minor criteria and label this an infective endocarditis now the organisms are important organisms are important this i have already told you okay organisms are important in a native valve which organism is common native native so it's v in the native it's very dense this is important you need to remember very dense in the native streptococcus very dense okay in drug abuser a for abuser okay staph aureus staph aureus in prosthetic wall prosthetic prosthetic there comes the e okay there is epidermidis for the first two months epidermidis is most common okay that is because you have done the operation and that because of the contamination epidermidis then okay it's aureus again okay it's aureus so you need to remember this thing in the native in uh, the the things as well 